This is Culture Matters in Malden, a new podcast that explores culture and arts as a lens to discuss important themes relevant to the Malden community. Malden exists in a region originally inhabited by the Penacook tribe. Over the past 360 years, waves of immigrants have shaped it to be a unique and diverse city with at least 42% of its current residents born outside of the United States. The high school boasts more than 64 languages, and today Malden is referred to as another Chinatown of Greater Boston. It is this rich history and cultural mix that makes Malden a unique place, a kind of microcosm of the world in five square miles. My name is Osa Schwab, and I am pleased to co-host this first episode of Culture Matters in Malden with my good friend, Poppy. I'm Poppy. I'm Osa. And this is Culture Matters. We are speaking with saxophonist, composer, and arranger David Artiga about life and jazz. David leads the David Artiga Quartet and runs the Sunday night jazz jam sessions that he founded in 2014. In 2017, David Artiga recorded Picture, a CD of original jazz compositions he performs with Max Ridley, Plamen Karadonev, and Dave Fox, members of his David Artiga Quartet also affectionately referred to as Jazz Brothers. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, David, since I got to meet you. And um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to start out with a little bit about your CD picture, because I feel like it gives us a picture of you and what you're about and about your feeling about jazz. Well, the picture is uh, an old-style CD package. I, I know it's a bit anachronistic these days to actually make a CD, but I felt like there's so much more to uh, playing jazz than just the music, although the sound is the most important thing. But I love uh, all of the venerable old albums that we listen to, in large part because of the information you gain by the pictures and the uh, the photographs and the liner notes and uh, sort of some peek into the uh, thought process that underlies the, uh, the result, which is, of course, the music itself. Let's start with the musicians that you played with for this CD, because there's a little bit of a lead up that enabled you or gave you inspiration to create the CD. Is that not right? Oh, absolutely. These guys are just incredible. You know, I I stayed in the liner notes that these are the most fantastic musicians I've ever had the pleasure to perform with. And that's no uh, overstatement at all. These guys are just amazing. And uh, the music, it it is common. Like if you go back to the Ellington Band or any number of iterations of Art Blakey's groups or Miles Davis's groups, 
the music is often so specific and personal to the actual personnel who are going to be executing that music. And I'm delighted to say that in this project, that was very much the case for a number of the compositions were literally written specifically based on how I knew these guys would, would breathe life into them. And so that was a, a huge part of the process. And, uh, and uh, you know, music is, well, not all music is personal, but that's the thing that I love so much about jazz is that it's obviously completely spontaneous or, or to varying degrees spontaneous. The jazz that I love the most is stuff that feels like it's made up on the spot, even if obviously certain aspects of the structure are preconceived and perhaps even worked over extensively, but the most successful performances, and this is true of classical music too, you know, often you hear people rave about Horowitz performing Chopin or something like that, and they, the highest praise that you'll ever hear is, it sounded like it was improvised, you know. So <laughs> That's um, true. these tunes obviously are written down, and some of them are a little complicated, but these guys, I describe them also in the liner notes as fearless, and this is truly a, a great description of these guys because they show up at a gig, I throw a chart in front of them they never saw before, and th they sometimes that's the best performance we ever get is like when it's so fresh and uh, they'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> working on the picture project for the last couple of years. What was the inspiration behind the name? How did you guys like create the entire project? I'm curious. Oh, great question. Well, it's actually, uh, I don't know if I've, I don't think I spoke about this on the liner notes, but um, picture, the name actually occurred to me. Well, it, it's the title of w one of the tracks on the album. And uh, my daughter, Sierra, who lives in California, I hadn't seen for some time. This is going back eight years at least. And I uh, got a beautiful photograph that she sent me. And it was quite remarkable, actually. Immediately upon looking at the photograph, this theme, da 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 da, this sort of polyrhythmic theme of picture popped into my mind. So there you go. That was the name of the song, and then when I decided to do the album, which is all original compositions, that uh, particular tune always stands out as a special thing, and so mm -hmm. I figured that would be a good name. So this has been eight years in the making. Oh, some of the tunes, there's one tune on there that I actually wrote probably about 25 years ago. Wow. A tune called um, Returning, mm -hmm. and I actually only named it I think around the time of making the CD <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> but this was a, an improvisation or a little kind of quirky harmonic structure that I came up with, I, I say about 25 years ago, sitting at the piano. Some of the tunes are four or five years old, and as I mentioned, a bunch of the tunes are, were written just in the last three years or so that I've been working with this particular quartet. Nice. 
I just have to ask uh, about the names of a couple of the pieces mm -hmm. oh, because we love them. I tried to look up uh, Powism. Pu Puism. I'm not sure how to pronounce Puism. it. Puism. Puism. <laughs> so tell us what does that mean? <laughs> oh, you, you didn't study the liner notes closely enough. It's, oh. the, the acronym is uh, indicated with an asterisk. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> Bad me. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a little inside joke for the DAQ because it is an acronym, and this gives you uh, perhaps a somewhat troubling window into my sense of humor. <laughs> but it, it's an acronym, and it stands for Plangent Ulations of a Soporific Mendicant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in English this time. <laughs> and, and this is a really hilarious inside joke with the group because imagine that plowman who speaks English perfectly, but he's from Bulgaria. He's asked me at least five times, what does that mean? <laughs> and to be honest, I'm not sure if... Max or Dave know what it means either. <laughs> That's sort of the joke, you know. So, but, but the idea, again, this is one of these themes that came into mind. And I had this absurdist name for a tune in the back of my mind for a while, too. And as soon as I heard that sort of stabbing, da -da 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 -da, this, this, this stabbing uh, theme of that tune, I just... I knew it was a tune that I had to write down, and, and I knew that I was going to use that ridiculous, crazy name for it. And uh, they have totally embraced it. I mean, they, they consider this to be our, our theme song, and it's so much fun to play with these guys. <laughs> really fun to listen to too um, but I was really I, I'll have to read liner notes more carefully next time. <laughs> I have a, another question for you what um like tell me about the writing process because uh, you said one of the songs is 25 years older I guess and you've been with the band for about four or five years yes this configuration just about four or five years yeah. so when it comes to putting together a project like this how involved is the entire band with writing coming up with the music composing etc I write everything in a completely solitary way mm -hmm. it's it's all my ideas but that's the incredible thing about jazz is that I know I've got down what I need to get down, but I don't, you know, it's, it's funny, like people who don't really know music or jazz, when they hear a quartet performance, it's like, oh, well, did, did you write out that bass line or did you write out that drum part? Or, and occasionally, like there, there's one tune, um, I believe it's De, De Cats on... Uh, <laughs> De Cats! <laughs> De Cats, and, uh, which, of course, is a little play on words, too. You know, my initials, D-A, so da, da, there's De Cure and De Cats. You know, I kind of play around with that a little bit. But uh, that was, De Cats has a, a bass line that I really like, and, and that needed to be written down, but only the first eight bars of it, and then it's simile, like, you know, play a bass line like this give something like that to Max and just stand back and he uh, that's one of the highlights of the, of the album is is the way he uh, realizes that bass line <laughs> In answer to your question, it's really, you know, as composers over the years do, it's sort of a very solitary thing coming up with, like, it's not collaborative at all, creating the the template for the composition. Okay. But then the moment you start to play it, it becomes completely collaborative. And actually, it, maybe it's a nice compliment to me, but th they never suggest to change anything. 
they just take it and run with it. And some good songs. (laughs) I guess they're okay. (laughs) On that note, I wanted, I had one question about, um, you describe the musicians as generous. And I thought about generous in terms of, um, you know, kind and supportive and so forth. But I wonder if there's another generous meaning in the playing process. Well, you, you kind of segue into something that's pretty deep for me. Uh, uh, great, great question because, you know, as I uh, often when I introduce these guys, uh, I say these guys are not just incredible musicians. These, these are incredible human beings. And I should probably say it the other way. These are incredible human beings, and they actually happen to be unbelievable musicians as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that – spiritual quality of generosity is at the core of just the way they live their lives you know and that comes through in the music and unfortunately i think a lot of people have it backwards are trying to create a certain effect by how they play often trying to play in an what they conceive to be an impressive or uh (laughs) <laughs> um, I don't know, new new and different way. But if it's, in my opinion, if it's not totally grounded in who you are, how you live your life, how what decisions do you make every second of your life relative to those in your environment, then it, it feels phony. And uh, – I don't pass judgment on other people's music. Some I like, some I don't. But what I have noticed is that people – well, you reminded me of a great quote from my website a little while ago that Igor Stravinsky said, I feel my music is best understood by children and animals. (laughs) I absolutely love that quote because to me what he's saying is – and again, I'm taking the liberty to interpret the great – Master Igor Stravinsky, but I've listened to a lot of his music. There's so much originality, just absolutely uncompromisingly revolutionary, groundbreaking innovation in his music. And he wasn't doing it to impress anybody. (laughs) He was doing it because he needed to do that. And that quote, to me, touches upon something really deep of that Yes, the music is intellectual. Jazz is intellectual music. You don't need to emphasize that. (laughs) What you need to emphasize is how you want to feel when you're playing. How do you want, which is no different from a musician, than how do you want to feel in your life? And I think we've all noticed if you have a bad feeling and you're near a child, the child instantly feels that if you have a bad feeling and you go to pet a dog the dog will instantly feel that and i think that on a certain level music is that simple if you connect on that feeling level you can connect to anybody also been performing regularly at the Lilypad uh, Jazz Jam Sessions. Is that not right? That's correct. Yeah, I uh, referenced that also in the album liner notes because that's been an enormously important part of what made this uh, 2017 CD possible <clears throat> is that, uh, you know, you can write great material, but if you don't perform it live somehow it never comes to life in the same way and the the lily pad jam jazz jam session is something i started it, it's hard to believe but almost five years ago now and it just keeps getting better and better it's like a kaleidoscope of people always new people coming in some people come for a couple of years and then you never see them again but there's always incredible talent coming in and a really appreciative audience not only for my efforts, but for everybody who comes to perform and improvise at the jam session or just to come and listen. A lot of people just show up to listen and enjoy the music. 
but as the, a composer, you know, to be able to write a tune and then show up and try it with my group in front of live people <laughs> is uh, indispensable. So that that's I, I've just gotten so much out of uh, hosting that jam session, and it continues to be a real uh, pleasure and a privilege to, to host that event. It's every other week on a Sunday evening, and uh, it's a great time to come out and just take part in the jazz community in Boston, which is an unbelievable jazz community, as everybody knows. I mean, all the music schools, so many talented people coming out of all these different institutions, and there just aren't that many places to play and even fewer mm -hmm. places to do jamming. So th this has been just a, a phenomenal experience for me. So David, would you say that that is your inspiration behind starting the lily pad was wanting to give that platform for jazz artists and other people that just want to go in and jam? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny that I used to go out to the Acton Jazz Cafe and they used to have jam sessions, several jam sessions every weekend. I think they had one on Saturday and then like two on Sundays. I think actually that's where I first met Dave Fox, my drummer. And, well, my drummer. I'm, I'm proud to lay claim to some of his time. <laughs> Dave is an absolutely incredible brother of mine. And like all these guys, Plowman and Max, they all gig and, and work in so many different configurations. And uh, I played for the first time with Dave out at a jam session at the Acton Jazz Cafe. And like so many other venerable uh, venues in town, that went belly up. You know, it's just really hard to keep uh, uh, any kind of a music venue open it's financially. Very true. very true. And after that disappeared, I, I was really missing the jam scene. And I said, well, why don't I look into starting one and i love the lily pad the room is just fabulous so uh I, god bless uh gil heron the owner of the lily pad uh you know i sent him an email he missed it and then got back to me three months later and said hey that sounds like a great idea right and the, uh, off right we the. go <laughs> we spoke before about uh, the idea of this ego in music and I love the fact that you said <laughs> your band uh, is generous and you guys have a lot of respect and collaborating is easy. Do you find that ego tends to be kind of like the downfall to why we don't see music as being easily interpreted? I I would tend to agree completely with yeah. what you just said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have a tremendous fascination for Eastern wisdom, Eastern, I have to use finger quotes when I say philosophy, because Eastern philosophy has basically absolutely nothing to do with Western philosophy. It's, it's not even the same thing. And I've read quite a bit of both. But, you know, the concern of Eastern philosophy is almost entirely uh, the disease that is ego and how to remediate that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, in the, in the arts... Well, for me, because I love music so much, I'm just super sensitive to what kind of feelings are being generated by various particular kinds of music. And it, personally, I feel it's very common. And I suppose it's understandable because people are trying to make their mark and accomplish something and make a career and make a living and all these different needs that they have. And that's fine, but when that becomes your reason for playing, then I think you have a problem. And, and you know, Herbie Hancock gave this incredible series of lectures about, he called it the ethics of jazz. What, what a mind. That's a phenomenal <laughs> set of, I, everybody needs to listen to that. It is unbelievable. Herbie, I had the great privilege to hear a few of, I think it was a five or six series. Unfortunately, I didn't see everyone, but I saw like three of them live. And you talk about, I mean, we're, we're so, it's such a treasure to have someone like Herbie still 
giving so much of himself. I mean, he could just retire and buy an island and <laughs> go relax, but he's, he's an artist. He has to give. And, and he said something about uh, that, you know, that idea of compromising your musical output by doing stuff that you think is going to be for your advantage rather than what you really need to say. And he wasn't judgmental about it, but he did say, you know, if he, you, you might think you could do that and okay, it'll be better to pay the bills that way or whatever. But then when you go to say what you really need to say that's really true and important, it might not be there. And to hear Herbie say that was like, whoa, yeah, this is something all of us need to think about carefully. It's funny because as I was reread the liner notes again and again from your picture CD, um, I just felt like it was sort of a lesson in philosophy, almost like jazz as a metaphor for living or being in some ways, like the characteristics of jazz. Um, if if you boil it down to its essential components, and you talk about honesty or. You said you start often with a melody in your composition, and that's, and correct me if I'm wrong, is sort of a way to be honest in a way, or that you want to bring your authentic self in your music, and that's on the compositional level. Is that true? Is, am I understanding what you intended there? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much right on the money. And I'm so thrilled that someone's actually reading those liner notes. <laughs> <laughs> Except the also acronym. Does research. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to build on that because I wonder, we talking about, you know, musicians wanting to impress um, and focused on the ego and so forth. And I wonder if there's a potential antidote to that in being ruthlessly honest. Uh, amen. Wow. What a question. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I, and believe me, I think about this stuff a lot, but I, I agree a thousand yeah. percent with what you just said. And I would describe it in precisely those terms, an antidote. Because, yeah. you know, I just a few moments ago referred to what in, in all of the literature, of, you know, the yogic tradition or the Taoist tradition, they, the, the, the Nogual Indians of Mexico, they, they all speak about the same thing. You know, Don Miguel Ruiz refers to it as the parasite. It, this, this thing inhabiting you that will eat your brain and eat your soul if you give in to the compulsions of being egotistical, you know, and it's kind of amazing that you guys are, are so aware of this because... It just comes down to awareness. If if you have a disease and you don't know you have a disease, then you really have a problem. And I, I know that sounds kind of extreme, but these are the terms that people who spent lifetimes thinking about this stuff describe it in. Um, and uh, so when you have a disease you need an antidote or you need the right medicine. And uh, I feel that that's exactly what art can be mm -hmm. um, for precisely the reasons that you just so beautifully articulated us. It's like there's a, there's a call to dig deep and find your own authenticity. Are you going to answer the call or not? And it's really... And the amazing thing about music, I love all the arts. I love dance. I love architecture. I, I love the MFA, you know, looking at 5,000-year-old flawless sculptures. It's all just mind-blowing. But the amazing thing about music is it's dynamic. It's happening. It's a performing art. And it will never come back. That nanosecond that just happened is blowing by you and gone forever. And so in a very unique way it calls to everybody there to to that authenticity and you can't think about it too much as a when you're playing you know you just got to try and be sincere and, and honest as 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 poppy was saying it, 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 get away from your own ego and yeah. and have the the real courage to say what you need to say without being afflicted with concern of, oh, what are people going to think and how is it going to be received and am I going to be judged? That's not easy. 
But in my experience, and I, I think it's reasonable to say the only reason that I have the audacity to even attempt it is because I've seen other people do it. You know, I, I just went to see Chris Potter at the Regatta Bar two nights back to back. I have never seen a greater musical performance in my entire life. Wow. And then I get a chance to say a few words to Chris. I've heard him play every chance I, I have, uh, you know, at least 30 times over the course of his career. And I've talked to him on a number of occasions, and there's just such profound humility and absolutely no posturing. And, you know, you meet somebody like that who's giving so much, who is dedicated an entire life to honing the mastery of his his art in my opinion, is to to a higher level than anybody who's ever played the saxophone. Yes, that, I know that's a crazy statement, but <laughs> go and see Chris Potter and see what you think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is not an ounce of ego in any note. It's not a single note that he plays. And I've heard him play a lot of notes. That's my main practice. Every day, I just put on Chris Potter and I play along with him. Wow. Why? Because he articulated himself in this beautiful uh, documentary that he did, Open Minds, which is on YouTube, which is fantastic. Everybody should watch it. He's asked, how, Chris, how do you practice? He says, well, basically, and he's like a little kid. He's so <laughs> unassuming, and he's just like smiling and just answering this question. He's having fun, you know. And he's like, I basically, my practice consists of recording myself, listening back, and then trying to discern for myself, I'm paraphrasing, of course, what feels true and what feels false. Wow. And I heard Chris say that, and I almost fell on the floor. It's like, oh, my God. I've never heard anybody say anything like that in my entire life vis-a-vis -vis creativity. And the next thought I had is, no wonder he sounds the way he sounds. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So I have a thought about, you talked about, you know, we need, one needs to have the courage to be authentic and to uh, dispense with the ego and um, being authentic could be, a, we talked about that being an antidote, but what you're doing at the lily pad and even Poppy, what you did with I am because we are and what I try to do, I feel like there's a need to set the stage and that platform so that people don't need to be fearful. Right. So there's some um, power that others have to create the atmosphere that allows you to be who you are without judgment and free to, to be authentic. And I, Herbie Hancock talks a little bit about that. Mm. Miles Davis created that platform for him mm. to some extent oh, and yeah. gave him the freedom even when he played that infamous wrong chord <laughs> in Stockholm. That is the best story where he, yeah. Miles Davis, turns around and does a little doodly doo that makes it all right, you know. Yeah. And, and Herbie Hancock didn't feel any judgment. And it's that he talks about that yeah. quite a bit, yeah. um, that atmosphere. Yeah, and once again, it, it ain't just music, and it ain't just performing. This is life, you know? It, <laughs> absolutely, totally. Total, I mean, that's why Herbie Hancock is talking about the ethics of jazz. It's not just yeah. about on the stage yeah. or in the studio. It's like, okay, carry this to everyday living and how you interact with people. But I feel like, you know, jazz... What, what you're doing at the lily pad and just how you talk about it, it's like, yes, it's music, but... Maybe we all need to become jazz musicians. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to me, jazz does present a remarkably special opportunity. And, of course, you know, of course I'm going to say that because I'm a total jazz head and have been for decades. But <laughs> there, I think even from an objective standpoint, like there is something very unique about jazz because – you do it as a performing art. You know, I mean, I love watching people make physical things. I could watch a glass and have watched glass blowers like for hours on end or watch somebody sculpting or throwing pots. It's all – the process is dynamic. But in jazz, 
it, it is the process. There's nothing other than the process that is that that's all there is once you stop playing there there ain't nothing left it's all gone and you know so much music in jazz a lot of stuff is written down as i allude to in the liner notes like you know you use these uh notations themes whatever as points of departure but everybody knows the idea is to make up something completely original on the spot with no premeditation that says something that feels true to you. And at the exact same instant that you're doing that, whether there's five people in the room or a hundred people in the room, everybody has the opportunity to ride along with it. And I, I suppose, you know, dance... Someone who's really into dance probably feels exactly that same way about watching somebody move. I, I just don't, to me, I, there's not the same connection. Somehow, you know, music, even though it's unbelievably abstract, like what's this something I ponder all the time? Why can music, instrumental music with no words, maybe on instruments you're not, not even very familiar with or never heard of, heard before. I listen to some Indian classical stuff, and it's like, oh, my God, or, or, or koto music from Japan or something. Like, that's perfect truth, and there's no words anywhere near it. How does that work? I, I have no idea, but you will get broad consensus on when somebody gives a really masterful performance, even in an idiom or from a culture that the audience doesn't even know. So that's the, the mystical thing about music. That, that for me is very, very unique. And it totally connects to what you're talking about, also that this authenticity, that this uh, trying, to, trying to be honest. <laughs> Do you think you were meant to be a jazz musician? You started with classical, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, and, and that's a great, great setup for a question that I wanted to ask you, Please. which was going over your bio. I know that you've lived, you were born in New Jersey. You've lived in California. You lived in Mass. You've gone to various schools studying music. And how do you feel like it has uh, impacted the way that you see music, the way that you make music, the way that you create Mm. Yeah, I've lived in, in a lot of different places, but just in the, in the United States. But, you know, I, I went from coast to coast. And, uh, boy, the West Coast has a very different flavor than the East Coast, for sure. <laughs> How so? Uh, oh, well, just, you know, so much more laid back. God, people, people in New England can be... A little, a little tense, a little uptight sometimes. Ten and two. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, everywhere you go, every experience. I think most artists would agree. Like your your output is just somehow an articulation of, of what all your various diverse experiences are. And and of course, studying in different contexts under different people was influential, you know, as a UC Santa Cruz uh, in California and studied with this crazy mad scientist sort of composer, uh, David Cope, who um, it's not very well known these days, but he, he composed some wonderful stuff. And he was a real groundbreaker in terms of electronic music nice. way back when everything was on magnetic tape, you know, before we even had any digital processing. This goes all, all the way back to like, you know, Edgar Varese and was it the 1929 World's Fair and Music Concrete and all this stuff? You know, he was... So all, all these influences somehow work in. Um, but, you know, as far as specifically how they unfold in a jazz life, well, it's kind of funny to consider because, you know, I, again, I think I mentioned in my liner notes of that of picture... Like Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, and I'm sure many others, but those were probably the most famous. They didn't like the word jazz, you know. They, they, oh, it's Miles. It's just a made-up word. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So you know, it's just semantics. But what does jazz mean to you? I mean, I, 
I think that uh, I very much agree with Chris Potter on this. In that in that uh, Open Minds sort of documentary, he he refers to his work with the underground quartet, which is really like a heavy duty funk outfit. But he says, almost with a glimmer of pride and a glint of pride in his eye, like, yes, I, I know, you know, this is kind of heavy funk, but I think it's very true to what jazz can be in the best sense of the word. And and to me, when I hear a, a towering master like Chris say something like that, what I hear is that, you know, jazz is, is your vehicle. And, and, and mm-hmm. it's you're not interested in, in in jazz, you, you have to get in one vehicle or another if you're going to go somewhere. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> but that, I, I think it's very much the same thing as what Beethoven was doing when he sat down at the piano and improvised and 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 just slew the salon full of people. I, I read a biography of Beethoven recently, and he laughs about how he could just systematically make everybody in the salon cry just by how he played. I mean, literally, everybody would be, like, sobbing, and he'd be laughing to himself. J.S. Bach was maybe not quite the same prankster, but he was the same way. He'd go Mm -hmm. into church without any idea and just play an entire mass. I mean, that's jazz. What do you hope the impact of your music, or maybe music in general, ha- will have to improve how things are today for people? <laughs> what do we need to improve? <laughs> uh, you're right. Uh, silly question. <laughs> in this climate? You, right. Oh, my God. Loaded question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 I, these are desperate times. These, these are really desperate times. Uh, people have so profoundly lost track of what it means to be human. Uh, I know that sounds like an incredibly opinionated statement. That's my opinion. We're in dark times, and uh, I think that uh, I'm not concerned about my musical legacy, I'm just not. I, don't, I just don't think of it in those terms. What I'm concerned about is, uh, you know, I do have a, 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 I'm blessed to have one incredible child, uh, my daughter Sierra. Yes, I, I absolutely want to make sure that we don't burn the planet out from under her feet. Uh, but further it's not just a you know a personal concern it's it's the the entire situation is um very challenging for everybody and and the the younger people trying to grow up in the, on this planet at this time it, this is yikes this is tough it, it, there's some crazy st- unprecedented stuff going on so absolutely my hope and i know that you, your intent with uh Art, the mold and art scene and Poppy, your intent with uh, I am because we are the whole, uh, what, what's the term again? The um, Ubuntu. Ubuntu, you know, this fundamental, not an intellectual understanding, but a visceral felt understanding of, well, that's simple old saw of it. A rising tide raises all vessels, or, you know, we all sink or swim together. These aren't just platitudes. This is, this is truth. And, you know, the, <laughs> the funny thing about so much really important truth is that it's so simple that it's immediately dismissed. Everybody wants complexity. Everybody wants to be clever. Everybody wants to do something unprecedented that nobody ever thought of before. I don't see a whole lot of good coming out of that, which is essentially a narcissistic <laughs> drive to promote yourself in some way. And, and so my my hope and, and really my conviction is that art has an incredibly important role and perhaps the central singular role in bringing people back to a recollection of 
why we're even here. Mm. And if people can't start remembering why we're even here, sharing this tiny little planet with all these billions of people, it's not looking good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it's a great thing that, you know, the three of us are here that create platforms for people and create platforms for creatives to come together to to rejoice, to commune, and just to share love, understanding, and, and appreciation for the arts. And I think we should do something together. And maybe it'll be cool, but it's just me. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, David, thank you so much for thank you talking so much, to man. us. Oh, thank you. This was a, a fabulous little collaboration right here, right now, and it was really a lot of fun. Thanks so much for entertaining my musings. Music heard on this episode of Culture Matters Malden comes from the CD Picture, the David Artiga Quartet with Plamen, Karadonev on piano, Max Ridley on bass, Dave Fox on drums, and of course David Artiga on saxophone. Culture Matters in Malden is recorded in the studios of Urban Media Arts, formerly known as MATV. For more information about this and other episodes, visit matv.org slash culture matters and follow us on instagram at culture matters malden this podcast is supported in part by a grant from the malden cultural council a local agency which is supported by the massachusetts cultural council a state agency